me thank you all for coming today. Uh, before I get to our program, just a couple of notes. Uh, renewal. If you haven't renewed your 2019 membership, please do uh, on your way out. I also like to mention that the 30th annual New, New Year's walking tour uh, of Old Melbourne by Frank Thomas and Bruce Morgan, January 1st at 10 a.m. at the River on Ocean Ave, where the dock is, right? Right, it's Great Melbourne Beach. Yeah. Melbourne Beach, it's a fantastic tour. Uh, if you have any questions, see myself or Bruce after the meeting. Uh, let's see. So, I'll introduce Laura Lee Thompson. She's co-owner of Dixie Crossroads Restaurant, and she's fifth generation Floridian. Uh, she's come here today to tell us what it was like to live, to grow up on the Indian River Lagoon. Uh, she loves this place. She's very much into its um, restoration, if that's a good word. Uh, so please welcome Laura Lee. Uh, if we can kill the lights, that would be really good. Right on. And you that door. Um, thank you for inviting me today. Um, this is a, a talk, I've been doing this talk for about 15 years, and I've uh, done it for all kinds of uh, organizations. Um, I'll change the beginning, I'll change the end, change some, something here and there, you know, depending on the, the different organizations that I speak to. Um, Excuse me, Laura Lee, can you turn your mic on? Is it not on? Is it on? There's a yeah, it's light on. on. Okay, okay, there it is. Yeah. Is it on now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I must have not had the switch in the right place. Not surprising. Um, so I, I've done this talk, um, like I said, for a bunch of different groups, but I've never, you, you guys are guinea pigs, I'll be honest with you. Um, I don't know how this is going to turn out because I've never had images before. So this is my, even though I've been doing it for like 15 years, this is the inaugural. Um, growing up on the Indian River Lagoon with images talk. So, and, and I'm really proud to be able to, to have you guys be, you know, be the, uh, the, the people that get to see it first. And, um, you know, over the years, as I did this talk, in my mind, I would be thinking, well, I need this image here, and I need that image there, and this would look good here, and this would look good there. And so, um, the, it, I have to admit, it was fun um, orchestrating this and putting it together. I really enjoyed it. A lot of times, I don't, you know, it's not fun to do this kind of thing. It's work and try to fit it in with everything else, but I actually had a good time doing this. Um, it's a mixture of, you know, some old photographs, old images, old newspaper that obviously you'll see them when they come up, some, some shots out of old newspaper articles and a lot of stuff that I stole off the internet. <laughs> so, you know, I, 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 I keep seeing, you know, these things, this may be copyrighted, this may be copyrighted, and then you click here to see what the copyright rules are, and, and there's this thing, you know, that says, it's okay if it's for education. So I figure I'm okay, because <laughs> my whole goal is to educate people about what the lagoon was like. <coughs> um, so many people are new to the area, um, and they don't, you know, they don't, they don't know what the lagoon was like in the, you know, 50, 60 years ago. And so, it, you know, how can we expect somebody to want to restore something and, and, you know, and change their behavior if they don't understand what it is that we're trying to restore? And and so, um, my apologies. If anybody sees anybody's work that they recognize when, when it comes up, please don't turn me in. <laughs> or, or let me know so that I can get permission to use their, their slides. And um, this version here, this particular version that I picked today, um, was the one that I used when I was asked to be the opening speaker for Governor Bob Graham when he was here uh, four years ago, when he was traveling the state and doing all those talks, trying to trying to educate people on why we needed to vote for Amendment 1. You know, what happened to Amendment 1 after it was passed was a train wreck, but that's, you know, that's another story. So um, this is my Governor Bob Graham talk, and um, I hope you enjoy it. So I, I will be reading from notes, too. I, I don't have this memorized, so here we go. We'll see if I get my timing down. 
Okay. <clears throat> my family's been here in Florida for a very long time. And like many other folks that live here in our great state, they started out from other places. Before the Civil War, my great-great-grandfather, Louis Thursby, left the industrial northeast to start a new life. He bought a trapper's hut that sat on top of an Indian mound right where the transparent waters of Blue Spring Run disappear into the tannin-stained St. John's River. The cabin soon became too small for Lewis's growing family, so he replaced it with a three-story house. Bustling with the turmoil of 10 children, the Thursby home was always open to visiting scientists and adventurers who flocked to Florida to study its strange flora and fauna. Of major interest were the tiny biological communities near Florida's extraordinary springs where tropical plants grew well behind, beyond their northern limits, able to survive because the constant flow of 72 degree water tempered winter's chill. The scientists encouraged Lewis's younger children to collect eggs and bird nests. The older kids were taught to process skins from birds and mammals that they shot. The children's work ended up in museums and collections of the wealthy in the civilized north, where the public was mesmerized by this mysterious exotic setting in the south. When I was a child, a treasured summer highlight was to journey inland and visit our great Aunt Belle. The youngest of Lewis's 10 children, Isabel Thursby, was still alive when we were young, but she was very old. We loved going to Blue Spring. The mystifying fact that crystal clear water bubbled out of the ground was as fascinating to us as it was to the scientists who visited Lewis and his family in their splendid home nearly a century before our arrival. Completely contrary to their warmth in the winter, the waters of the spring were shockingly cold in the searing heat of summer, a welcome effect for a family who had no air conditioning. My early childhood was spent in a house that was next to a body of water that was very different than the waters of Blue Spring. We had the great fortune to live right on the shore of the Indian River Lagoon. My dad had a small boat dealership on the ground floor of the building and our family crammed into the small apartment above. My brothers and sisters, the four of us, along with various cousins and friends who were actually allowed to play with us, evolved into the pier gang. That's because my grandfather ran the nearby Titusville Pier, and that's where we hung out. We terrorized the kids from town in a nearby trailer park when they came out to the pier to go fishing. Fishing was the major tourist activity in Titusville, as it was in many coastal communities. There were a lot of fishing piers in Florida back then, and most operators charged a fee. Our pier was different because my grandfather didn't charge people to fish off of his dock. He believed he could make an adequate living just off of selling bait and renting fishing poles and nets and lights. My dad added power lines with plug-ins under the railings, which was another thing that made our pier unique. You could use electric lights instead of messing around with fussy gas lanterns. My grandfather proudly marketed his pride and joy as the world's longest free fishing pier where one could fish at night with electric light. And so, I'll take a minute to pause. You can see the advertisement on the, on the side of the pier truck. Guess who that is? Uh -huh. That's me. <laughs> this picture was taken in 1955 on Main Street in Titusville. And that was our float for the Titusville 4th of July parade. Back then, I mean, you guys that have been here for a while, you remember that we used to have parades on the 4th of July. It was a big deal. So that was a giant cardboard trout that's, that's in the boat. Um, it became one of my most cherished play objects. Um, after the parade, my grandfather moved it up into the upstairs storeroom in this building that was next to where, where we lived. And I would go upstairs and play on that fish. I, I'd ride it like a horse, I'd ride it between the fence, and then jump up and down on it. And it finally caved in. <laughs> For me, oh, years. I Two. Two years, Two years old. old. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Right, Mom? Yeah. <laughs> and I haven't changed a whole lot over the years. I have my little ball cap on and my little blue jeans, you know, and that's kind of the look that I still have come. Um. <laughs> <laughs> 
The pier was a big part of Titusville's social life, especially during shrimping season. Springtime shrimp runs were a huge event. On a good run, you could quickly fill several buckets of, of, of shrimp in no time. And you could never tell when the, the shrimp would run. Usually it was freezing cold and really early in the morning, like around four o'clock in the morning. When the shrimp started running, my grandfather would call two or three people on the phone and they'd call the rest of their friends. Within minutes, the pier would be covered with people, many of whom were still in their pajamas and bedroom shoes. <laughs> they didn't want to lose the time to get dressed. Sometimes the shrimp would only run for just a few minutes. <coughs> Dad's job was to get out of bed and go out to the bait house and help my grandfather rent nets and lights. We considered it our duty to race up and down the pier, jumping over poles and getting in people's way. <laughs> Any misstep would send someone's carefully arranged nets and fishing rods flying. We spent a lot of time running from angry grown-ups in flapping bathrobes. They hated to hear us come thundering down the pier. And I chose that picture because I love that, I love that young man. Um, you can see how excited he is to be out on the pier in the dark, in the excitement. You, you can't imagine how exciting it is when the shrimp are running and, and people's poles are flying. And um, I just, I see myself, I see myself in that picture. The, obviously, these pictures are, are from modern times. We, our family worked. You know, we worked hard. We never took pictures, unfortunately. We've had a wonderful life, but it's all in our memories. Um, so you, some of these pictures, you'll have to have to kind of think back what it would look like if they were in black and white and, and old. There was a small boat basin with a ramp by our house. My father built a dock so people could tie up their boats after putting them in the water. When the wind blew out of the east, big mats of seagrass drifted in. Then the manatees would come, only we called them sea cows. We could sit on the dock and touch the backs of the grazing sea cows with our bare feet. When I was seven, I inherited a small rowboat that came with restrictions. I was not allowed to go past the entrance to our boat basin. I didn't mind because there were all kinds of things to discover just in the small world of our boat basin. Sea squirts and barnacles and oysters grew on all of the sea walls and the pilings. A variety of inter interesting creatures could be found just by turning over rocks. That's a polychaete worm in the middle. Um, they, they, the shoreline, if you dug into the shoreline, there would be hundreds of these worms, and when you break them open, red liquid comes out. So we call them blood worms. And we would have contests to see who could fill up a little small Dixie cup with blood worms. And we would present them to mom. And she very grace, I don't know what she did with them, but we, we, it, was, um, it was a big contest to see who could catch the most blood worms from mom. What did you do with those worms, mom? You probably just poured that out. I naked on that person down the toilet. It was a game. Back then, you could walk down any shoreline of the river, and there would be fiddler crabs as far as you could see. The big ones would hang outside their burrows, waving their big claws, trying to attract a lady fiddler. And as you approach them, they'd race toward their holes with a whispering whoosh and the sound of hundreds of fiddler crabs running for cover looked like water partying as you, walk, as you moved along the shoreline. The motion, I'm sorry, motion of hundreds of fiddler crabs. And they would part and they would run to their holes and it, and it, it would be like Moses in the waters parting as you walked down the shoreline. With the coming of spring, hordes of bigger crabs made their, their um, presence known. It's hard to imagine how many horseshoe crabs were in the river when I was young. They would crawl up on the shoreline to lay their eggs, and the whole shoreline would be covered with horseshoe crabs, and more of them would be wading out in the water. You knew they were there because you could see their tails slowly waving in the air like sticks above the surface of the water. And this video, it gives me hope, because I shot this this year, in February 2018. At, at, at the southeast corner of the Titusville Causeway. It was, I never saw horseshoe crabs that big, even when I was a kid. It was stunning. 
there's like a, about a 500 foot shoreline where it's not covered with gigantic boulders and it's a beach and I estimated that night there was about 12,000 horseshoe crabs there and they were there the night before and the night after they came in and out for about two weeks but that that was the peak Warm weather also brought on jellyfish season. We always knew that summer was here when clouds of moon jellies floated into our boat basin. There were times when there would be so many blue moon jellies it seemed like you could walk on them. They were all different sizes and you could see them all the way from the bottom of the river to the surface. And moon jellies were everywhere and they'd be that thick from the head of the river up by Scottsmore all the way down to Stewart. When the moon jellies came in, they just flooded the river. And, and they would all come in at once, and it was just wonderful. My dad showed us how to pick up the moon jellies without getting stung. It's, it's really not that hard. You have to do it like this. It's kind of hard doing it sitting down. But I have an illustration here. What you do is you have to find a moon jelly that's floating up near the surface of the water. You can't get one that's down deep or you'll drown trying to get it out of the water. And you put your hand on top of it, and you force it down in the water at the same time that you flip your hand up. And when you bring your hand out of the water, then it looks like that. So you've got the moon jelly upside down on your hand and your arm, and it can't sting you then because the, the stinging things are on the bottom, and it can't sting you. We had some spectacular battles using moon jellies as projectiles. <laughs> After a major fight, the dirt road by our house would be covered with blobs of jelly. We'd laugh and run and cars squashed them. We even rigged up catapults that could fling moon jellies for greater distances. Like Larry the Cable Guy with his watermelon launcher, only our hurling mechanism was much cruder. As you can see, right there. When it started getting cold, the cone jellies would come. Only we call them pocketbook jellies because to us, they look like pocketbooks. Some of y'all may not know what a pocketbook is. That's what Southern ladies call purses. All Southern ladies had a collection of pocketbooks. My grandma Thompson was buried with her favorite pocketbook in her hands. We never heard of pocketbooks being called purses until all the Northerners started moving down here because of the Space Center. Pocketbook jellies were special because you could pick them up without getting stung. You could hold them in, the, in your hand and you could see all the colors of the rainbow as their fluids moved through them. They were all different sizes. There were cone jellies so small you could barely see them, all the way up to jellies that were bigger than my hand. The tiny ones were wonderful to put in jars with river water. When you held them up to the sunlight, it was like holding a container full of prisms. Cone jellies are also bioluminescent. When you jiggle them at night, they glow like green fire. You could catch all kinds of fish off the pier when I was little. Back then, the water in the lagoon was much cleaner. In fact, a stroll down any dock in the early 1960s was like wandering over the top of a giant aquarium. Sometimes the water would be so clear you could go all the way out to the um, end of the pier and you could see the bottom. Even though it was more than 10 feet deep out there, you could see the fish swimming right up to your bait. And it's hard to imagine how many blowfish were in the river when I was a kid. There were so many blowfish, you couldn't get your bait through them to reach the fish you wanted to catch. Frustrated anglers would leave them on the pier to die, hoping to thin them out. The pier was always covered with dead blowfish. Some of them puffed up before they expired and remained so after their demise. We like to run up and down the pier and kick them back in the water. But you had to be really careful not to kick a blowfish in the mouth with your bare toe because they have razor sharp teeth. They eat barnacles off of pilings. And they can really hurt you when, even when they're dead. There must have always been a lot of blowfish. My uncle Herman told me that when he was a kid and he fished on the old wooden bridge in the middle of the night, he could tell when a car was coming long before he could even see the headlights. He said it sounded like a gun battle coming towards him as the car ran over all the dead blowfish. <laughs> Bottlenose dolphins fed outside the entrance of our boat basin every evening. We could stand on the pier and see the dolphins tossing mullet in the air and leaping after them. Watching the dolphins from our pier was better than being at Marineland because the dolphins were in the wild, in their home in the river. 
I got a little bit older and my dad gave me a little three horsepower kicker for my rowboat. Suddenly my world expanded. I could finally reach the closest oil islands and I could go all the way over to the east side of the lagoon. I began my career as a tour guide, taking my friends out on the water, always eager to show them my beloved Indian River. The following summer, my dad announced that it was time for me to start working. My grandfather needed live bait, um, live shrimp to sell at the pier, and I was going to catch them. I was about nine years old. I don't think that the child labor laws were as restricted back then <laughs> as they are today. If they were, my dad figured our family was exempt. He helped me build, uh, build a live well in my rowboat, and he built me a push net so I could catch bait shrimp for the pier. And so this is a push net, um, and it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Um, you, you put it down at the edge of the grass, and you push it just like, oh, you guys can't see that. See this. Push it like that. And for, for me, I had to put the handle up against my chest. Um, it was really hard work, um, e even for a grown-up. I must have looked pretty funny pushing that big net around, but I was in hog heaven. Every morning, we'd load my rowboat into the back of Dad's truck and take it up the Hallover Canal, where he would drop me and the boat off. And I'd spend the day doing whatever I wanted to do. Of course, I had to push the net so I'm catch a few shrimp to justify the trip up the Hallover Canal, but I mostly spent my time exploring. There were colorful corals and algae growing on the rocks. There were rich, vibrant hues visible far below the surface. It was a great place to watch for dolphins, and sometimes I was lucky enough to see a big <coughs> sea turtle cruising through the canal. The best place to push for shrimp was in the seagrass beds along the west sides of the string of spoil islands that run north from Hallover Canal. I loved seeing all the things that got captured in my push net. I caught magical creatures like pipefish and seahorses and weird looking spider crabs and little tiny porcupine fish and little tiny blowfish. I also caught a lot of shrimp. Sometimes I'd bump my net up against a stingray that was so big it would knock the handle of the net out of my hands as it leaped off the bottom and flapped away in a big cloud of sand. My dad would come back in the afternoon, we'd put my shrimp in a garbage can with an aerator, load the boat in the truck and drive back to the town and sell my shrimp to my grandfather at his pier. Can you imagine dropping your kid off in the middle of the wilderness now, you'd be arrested. <laughs> and that was only in the summertime. She didn't see a school to do that. <laughs> the following year, I advanced to a bigger boat with a 20 horsepower motor. I could now get to all over canal under my own power. We built some pigfish traps, and I added pigfish income to my, to my shrimp money. Y'all know what pigfish are? No. There's a picture of one right there. Um, they're little, they're tropical little fish. Um, they're, it's, they're characteristic of, of a lot of different um, fish that use the Indian River Lagoon as a nursery. So um, they're, they spawn, they're both adults spawn out in the ocean, the fry swim into the inlets, they go into the sea grasses of the lagoon, and they grow up. And, and shrimp do the same thing, and then when they mature, they go out to the ocean to spawn. Mullet do the same thing. It's, it's incredible the amount of um, commercially and recreational fish traps early in the morning. The pigfish were so thick, my traps would be half full when I dragged them out of the water. The tiny fish shimmering gold in the morning light. After checking the pigfish traps, I'd go behind the islands and push my net around for bait shrimp. And by late afternoon, I'd be heading back to the pier dodging thunderstorms along the way. The following summer, one of the commercial fishermen asked me why was I selling my pig fish for bait. He said I could make a lot more money if I used them to catch fish. He taught me how to splatter pole for big sea trout. Y'all know what splatter poling is? Yeah. It, it, it's a, the term splatter poling comes from what you do with the end of a cane pole, or in my case, I was using a radio antenna, a fiberglass radio antenna. <laughs> it had a lot more play in it than a cane pole. And, and what you want to do is um, you, you, you want to find the place where the seagrass starts breaking up. So like when you're close to shore and the seagrass gets a lot of sun, sunlight, it's a carpet. It's a lush carpet. But then the further out you go, it's, it starts getting less and less sunlight and the, and the grass starts breaking up. 
and it gets spotty, and you get like patches of white sand in between the patches of seagrass, and that's where the big fish hang out. And you want, you want to figure out which way the wind is blowing so that you can figure out which way your boat is going to drift, and you sit right at the back of the boat, you hook the pig fish right above its bottom fin, and you fling it out, and then the wind starts pushing the boat along over the top of where the spotty seagrass is. And you hold the pole like this, and every once in a while you just kind of bump the bottom of the pole, and that <coughs> sends a motion up to the tip of the pole, and the tip of the pole will flip, and that will go all the way down the line, and it will cause the pig fish to get dumped upside down. Now the reason they call them pig fish is because they make a sound that sounds just like a baby pig. It's like a squeal and a grunt, and when you anchor them, like when you dump them upside down, they make that sound. And usually within a few seconds after, after they make that sound, and you can feel it, if you're holding the pole right, you can feel the sound coming up back through the pole, and then a few seconds later, bang, something big hits, hits, hits eats the pig fish. And, and then, you, then you fight it with the pole. It's a very exciting way to fish. Um, it was easy to catch 50 pounds of trout in just a morning of fishing. That old fisherman was right. I made a lot of money using the pig fish for bait, but I always saved a few um, pig fish for my grandfather to sell at the pier. I spent the next couple of summers content with trapping pig fish and fishing for sea trout. After that, true greed set in. My dad gave me a bigger boat, a 23-foot um, fiberglass crab boat with a 75-horsepower motor. And my friends from school helped me build 150 blue crab traps. That's me, 15 years old. Back then, it didn't matter where you put a trap in the water. You could put a crab trap in six inches of water next to the shoreline. It would have crabs in it the next day. You know, but there were spots where you, you did better. Um, I pull my crab traps every afternoon after school, after school, mom. Spending countless hours on the water. I pull 75 traps on one day and then the next day I pull the next 75 traps and just rotate back and forth. Uh, yeah. Beautiful, aren't they? The next year, um, my grandfather Watwood co-signed for my first bank loan and I financed enough money to buy 500 yards of gill net a bigger motor, and a bow runner mullet boat. And those, those are beat up old bow runners over on the right. Um, and then, and um, you put the net on the back of the boat, and mine had, a, like, mine had a steering column. It actually had a steering wheel. It was hooked to the motor, and so I could stand on that box right there, and the steering wheel stuck up, and, and then, you know, it, it, it was lethal for fishing. I mean, you, you were up high, you could see the mullet, and then when you saw fish, you just throw a, I had a Clorox jug, jug tied to the um, net. You fling the jug out of the back of the boat, and the net starts peeling off the back of the boat, and you circle the fish. And then um, you run around inside the circle, stomping up and down and making a lot of noise to try to scare the fish into the net, let it soak for a while, and then pick it back up. I loved it. It was, it was amazing. How much money were you getting for the crab, the 75 crabs? For the crabs, like a nickel a pound. A nickel a pound? I, I, yeah, almost nothing. The fish were worth, and, and mullet were worth a nickel a pound. Real mullet were worth a quarter a pound. I might have been getting more than that for the crabs, but it was, crabs are like three or four dollars a pound now to the fishermen. It was way less than a dollar. Um, I don't remember the crabs. I do remember the mullet, though. A nickel, nickel a pound for the mullet. Um, but you know, I can catch like five, six, seven hundred pounds of fish in an afternoon of fishing. So even at a nickel a pound, that was good money, you know, for for the rest of my friends were like <clears throat> walking up and down the highway picking up bottles, you know, to make their spending money. Or or working bagging groceries at Publix. You know, this is what I have to do. <laughs> I started spending entire nights out on the lagoon doing my homework under the dim glow of the 15 watt light bulb. One of my favorite places to fish was Banana Creek. 
which was full of big alligators. When I shine my spotlight down the shoreline, dozens of big red eyes glared back at me. The alligators liked to swim along my net, looking for an easy meal. Now, I didn't mind donating an occasional fish to a large gator to keep him happy. There were two problems. The first one was that the gators were discerning diners. They definitely preferred the 50 cent a pound spotted sea trout over the nickel a pound mullet. And they would swim past 20 mullet to find a trout. The second problem was that the gators couldn't get the fish out of the net by pulling on it backwards. That's why it's called a gill net. When the fish swims into it, its head pokes through. Once its gills poke through, the gills spread out and you can't back the fish out of the net. When the trout wouldn't come out, the gator would give up and swim right by my fat gilled mullet as it searched for its next spotted morsel. The gator would work its way down the net, punching holes in my trout, rendering them totally useless for anything except crab bait. At that point, you can't sell a trout that's full of gator holes. <laughs> and, and then I'd be pulling, I'd be madly pulling my boat after it. I'd have my pull, my, my over pulling my boat, chasing the gator. It must have been a pretty comical sight. A 15-year-old girl out on the river in the middle of the night whacking a 10-foot gator on the head with an oar trying to make it let go of my fish and go away. My poor mother would have had a heart attack if she really knew what I was doing. I, I was also a pretty prolific liar when I was young. But I survived. And I was very gullible. Oh, I went the wrong way. See, I told you there would be some flaws. Okay, here we go. Um, I love being out by myself on the river after dark. On calm, moonless nights, every star reflected in the water, and you couldn't tell where the river stopped and the sky began. Running the river on a night like that was like flying through the Milky Way. On summer nights, the bioluminescence was spectacular. Staring down into the dark water was like peering into a fairyland. Tiny luminous creatures scattered through shimmering seagrass like flickering stars. Schools of mullet panicked as I drew near, sparking radiant jade explosions on the surface and fireworks down below. Bottlenose dolphins streaked beneath my boat and burst from the water, showering brilliant fluorescence. When the wind blew, you could stand on the tight little <coughs> causeway and look east over a river that was alive with dazzling white caps. When the northeasters of fall sent mullet to the sea to spawn, I ranged further south, looking for rowfish between O'Galley and Sebastian Inlet. It was common to see school after school of mullet moving south, acres and acres of traveling, jumping mullet hanging right on the surface and swimming with their lips out of the water, like mullet often do. The giant pods of fish were a frenzy of, of noise and commotion as pelicans and cormorants crashed into the middle and dolphins attacked the edges. You could actually hear schools of row mullet going by, even in the pitch black darkness. It sounded like water roaring over a waterfall. And there's a couple of pictures of, uh, of the, the mullet nets back before the net ban. I graduated from high school in 1971 Hoping to temper my crusade to become a full-time fishing fool, my parents sent me to FIT where I studied oceanographic technology. We reached a compromise and I took a smaller boat down to Jimson Beach to continue my practice of doing homework at night while my net soaked in the lagoon. I discovered that the southern end of the Indian River Lagoon is really quite different than it is up here by, on the north end by Titusville. There were tropical <coughs> fish down there, the same colorful fish you see in saltwater aquariums, and banded coral shrimp, and arrow crabs, and different kinds of seagrass. For the first time, I caught barracudas in my nets. Not long after leaving college, I started running big boats out in the ocean. A completely new universe opened up for me, and the Gulf Stream became my new playground. I was thrilled to see new species of dolphins and whales and sunfish and huge jellyfish, 
and to catch wide-ranging ocean fish like tuna and swordfish and sharks. I spent the next decade on the ocean, fishing from Hatteras, North Carolina, to the Texas-Mexican border, a pioneer in the, uh, the longline bottom fishing industry in the Gulf of Mexico. In all my travels on this country's southern oceans and inland waters, I never found a place that was blessed with the diversity of habitats and the variety of wildlife that we have right here in our home. I left the ocean in 1987 and returned to Titusville to help out at my parents' restaurant. When I finally got back out onto the lagoon, I was appalled at its horrible condition. I couldn't believe this had happened in such a short time. I was only gone for 10 years. 25 years passed as I worked in my family's restaurant and became involved in ecotourism, starting a birding festival in Titusville that's put us on the map as a superb destination for watching wildlife. Late one afternoon, while driving home from a Tourist Development Council meeting, I noticed that the setting sun was destined to stage a really good show. Lacy, icy clouds from the trailing edge of a cold front are always good for spectacular colors. I should have stopped at my house to catch up on emails, but the lure of the river at sunset was way too strong. When I got to Mims, I headed up Hammock Road, thinking about the world-famous Indian River citrus groves of the past. They're gone now, the victim of freezes and citrus greening. The old groves are slowly turning residential. The good thing is that the lots are big ones. They're mostly five to 10 acres or more. It had been a while since I'd driven through the hammock. I passed Burkholm Road and was stunned to see new young citrus trees. Someone had actually planted orange trees where an old grove once stood. Further up the road, I, I was thrilled to see that homeowners had filled their big yards with new citrus trees. My heart was filled with hope for the citrus and fear for what I would find at the river as I pulled into Scottsmore Landing. I got out of my truck and pushed through the mangroves to get down to the river. The water was high, way higher than it ever got when I rooted around this shoreline as an adolescent. Too high to tell if there were any fiddler crabs around. Climate change must be real. The water tells me it's so. The river was murky just like my longtime friend Larry the Crabber told me it was. The surface was glassy, not a breath of wind stirred. Piles of dead seagrass lay rotting on the shore. It seemed like nothing was alive. Now this was in, um, this was in 2014. It was after the first algae blooms and, and when we had the massive, massive loss uh, of seagrass in the lagoon. Um, and this is what the shoreline looked like. The, it, it, was, it was incredible how much seagrass died and, and rotted on the bottom or else washed up on the shore. I don't understand how this could have happened. This part of the river seemed healthy. There's no urban runoff here. I stepped out onto a rock in the water and I closed my eyes and I listened for the mullet. I listened for the mullet, for without the mullet there will be no predators. I listened for the mullet and the memories came roaring back. That's what I'd done in my youth. When I couldn't find fish running the shoreline with a spotlight, I'd shut off my motor and listen in the dark. I stood on that rock and relished the clatter of dragonflies and the soft whisper of the wings of an osprey as it flew overhead. Clapper rails clicked in the salt marsh behind me and a great blue heron squawked as it chased a smaller heron away from its prey. And then I heard what I'd been listening for, a flat, sloppy splash right in front of me. I opened my eyes just in time to see the mullet jump again, flashing pink from the clouds in the setting sun. Another one jumped. Uh oh, oh, I went backwards. Oh my God, you guys have to tell me. I'm not looking at the screen. <laughs> okay, here we go. Another one jumped, and another one. The mullet weren't very big. At that time of the year, they should have been great big mullet jumping, but they were mullet nonetheless, and I stood on my rock and happily watched them until it was too dark to see. As I turned to leave, 
the navigation lights on the railroad bridge to the south reminded me of a long past summer morning. I was heading to Mosquito Lagoon to run my pigfish traps and a splatter pole for sea trout. An interesting scene unfolded in the water ahead as I passed under the railroad bridge. I saw a lot of splashing and a lot of fins. No birds were diving, so I knew it wasn't a bait, a bait pod. I steered my boat toward the commotion, commotion to investigate and noticed a tremendous amount of dolphin movement around this big ruckus. I eased closer, watching the rise and fall of dozens of fins. Inching nearer still, I was stunned to see an oval ring of dolphin fins that did not dip below the surface. Four feet out from the ring of fins, the water churned in a second oval, a perfect perimeter of white water that surrounded the inner ring of fins. In all the hours I'd spent on the lagoon, I'd never experienced anything like this. I cut my motor and paddled slowly towards the turmoil. I finally got near enough to see what the center of the frenetic activity was, and I was amazed to witness something that few people will ever see. An injured dolphin was the center of attention. Family and friends from her pod surrounded her, each one with their nose under her body. They frantically pumped their tails, paddling furiously to hold her up so she could breathe. I watched in silent awe. Their frantic squeals rang in my ears. When one of the rescuers tired, it dropped down to be instantly replaced by another of the circling dolphins. They diligently kept up this behavior, lifting their injured friend. I put down my paddle and leaned back to contemplate this emotional scene I've been so fortunate to observe. The wind finally pushed my boat far enough from the dolphins so I could start my motor without disturbing them. I humbly turned north and continued my journey up the Holover Canal. After a day of fishing, I headed home, passing the spot where I'd seen the dolphins eight hours early, earlier. And there they were, still holding up the injured dolphin, still doggedly supporting her heavy body to keep her from drowning. Who knows how long they kept it up. My guess is that they held their friend up until she drew her last breath. When I passed that spot the next morning, the dolphins were gone. The north end of the river doesn't look that much different now than it did when I fished it 50 years ago. It's wild and free, bordered by a wildlife refuge on the east and development stopped by the railroad on the west. The river still looks the same, the difference is that the mullet are gone. The great schools of mullet, acres and acres of traveling, jumping mullet, hanging right on the surface and swimming with their lips out of the water like mullet often do. They're gone. The schools of mullet that you can hear going by, even in pitch black darkness, they're gone. Spirits of our river seagrass meadows, they're gone. We live in a world of ever-changing baselines. What seems normal to each new generation would have been unacceptable to those who came before. I will never see the Union River the same way that my grandfather saw it. What is abhorrent to me seems normal to my grandchildren. They've never seen a shoreline covered with fiddler crabs or a water column filled with graceful moon jellies. They've never experienced pulling an oyster or a clam from the water and being able to eat it right on the spot. One way to measure the character of a community is to look at what it protects. We protect what we value. The Indian River is the heart and soul of this community. The river can't speak, so we must be her voice. Our river needs help, and we must be as steadfast as the dolphins as we hold her up so she can keep breathing. Our economy and our quality of life depend on her survival. The river, and I'm serious, the river is worth, they done, uh oh, I have no idea what I just did. <laughs> My brain, I think it's coming back. Anyway, this, this is an economic um, impact uh, slide. This was a study done by the Treasure Coast. Um, it's a study that was done for the whole entire five county length of the Indian River Lagoon. 
And it was determined that um, the lagoon, the annual economic value of the Indian River Lagoon is $7.6 billion a year. Billion. $7.6 billion. Um, and so that's how we have to start looking at the lagoon. Here it comes. So there you go, $7.6 billion. Um, and the return on investment. And this is how we have to start thinking about the lagoon. I mean, it's pretty, it's there, it helps you sell houses and everything, but we're going backwards. And so everybody needs to start thinking about the lagoon as, as an investment. It's an investment not only for us and our economy, but for our kids and our grandkids. For every one dollar <coughs> we spend on um, restoration for the Indian River Lagoon, the return on that investment is $33. And I challenge anyone to, to find any kind of, of, <laughs> of return on, on investment that's equal to that. It's huge. Um, and then this is, you know, this is what I've lived with. This is what my family's lived with for the last 30 years. An 80% decline in the harvest value of shellfish. 72% decline in the number of pounds harvested. There's no commercial fishermen left on the river now. They cannot make a living. It's, it's so sad. Um, and so, you know, what is success going to look like? I mean, it, it, this is what it's going to look like. There's a lot of user groups for the Indian River Lagoon, and everybody is holding up their hand going, we need it for kayakers, we need it for recreational fishermen, we need it to sell houses, we need it for tourism. But, you know, if you think of all of the, all of the user groups that use the Indian River Lagoon, if you wanted to pick a poster group for success, it would be the commercial fishermen, it would be the commercial fishing industry. And even though we're reviled, you know, and everybody thinks that, Commercial fishermen are horrible. We 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 suffered a an image, you know, that is hard to deal with. People think we're evil, but we're not. We feed the non-voting public, you know. We we feed people that don't have the money to, to buy a boat and be able to go out and catch their own seafood, and and it's a healthy it's a healthy product too. It's not like farm-grown shrimp that have been in a nasty pond and have been fed growth hormones to make a mean source of protein. And so when, when we can restore the river to the point where not only are the clams and oysters back in enough abundance to harvest them commercially, and it, they have to be safe to eat too. The water has to be clean enough so that it's safe to eat clams and oysters that come out of the river, and it's safe to eat fish that come out of the river. And when the river, it, when the river has enough abundance of, of the animals that live in it, so that commercial fishermen can once again support their families from the harvest from the river, then everybody else wins. The recreational fishermen win, tourism wins, real estate wins, everybody wins. Yes, ma'am. And, and the culprit one, two, three is what? Too much nutrients going into the lagoon. You think about it, other than Sebastian Inlet, there's no place for, there's no flushing in the river. It's like a gigantic bathtub. And then, and then more and more people keep moving to the county and growth is good. We just, we have to change our behavior. It's, it's a huge culture change for the people that, that live close to all of Florida's waterways, everything. Our springs are in trouble. Our lakes and rivers are in trouble. It's all from too many nutrients going into the waterways. And so people need to learn how to landscape with native plants that don't need fertilizer and, and, and are beautiful and, and help the, the butterflies and the bees. And, you know, when you have a yard full of St. Augustine grass, you're not going to have birds come into your bird feeder. You're not going to have butterflies. It's so much better to, to garden with native plants. But um, and why think, is it that, that they cannot put a stop to selling this fertilizer? Because the fertilizer, because the, the petrochemical industries have a lot of money that they spend on lobbyists. But, the, and but it's worth it, $7 billion. I mean, you, <laughs> you know. You, you, people, people have to talk to their legislators. 
Yeah. That's the only thing. They're the only people that can do anything, are legislators. We need a lot of money. The Brevard County citizens had the vision to vote for the half penny sales tax, which, because the economy's gotten better, I don't know what's going to happen now, but right, you know, we've had a good economy for the last few years, and, and that, that original estimate of 340 million jumped to 400 million. But it's going to take, just to fix the wastewater infrastructure alone, for the wastewater treatment plants to upgrade all of the county's wastewater treatment plants. Um, to upgrade them and re refit, retrofit the pipes because a lot of the pipes are old. They, go, they went in the ground in the 1960s and 1970s. They're cracked. Sewage is leaking out of them and going out into the groundwater. Can't they be sued? Can't the fertilizer company be sued to take care of the problem because they should be held responsible? They, before we get too much into that, yeah. this is really more history. You guys can talk afterwards. Okay. Like back last October, sure. we had Virginia Barker here. Yes. Yeah. No, so, I go, you want to talk? Yeah. This. But let's keep right. going because we only have. Well, this is it. This okay. is it. I'm done. All right. Aww. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions, like from her past? Go ahead. Is there any questions from uh, for Laura Lee? I grew up on the Indian River in Grant, and uh, you're the only place that has fried mud. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and your sister at Wild Seafood has spoke mud. Thank you. I go 100 miles to get your food. I'll be there this coming Friday. Thank you. <laughs> species all up and down? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so what they have in Chesapeake is the same species as what they have their crab. Yeah. Now, some of the oysters are different species, but I think the blue crab is the same thing. But you'll find different oysters all up and down. Or, or is, it, is, it, is, it, is part of the business with the oysters, the water in which they grow, could it be this, is it like wine, that the apological oysters taste different because it grows in Apalachicola, but the one at Hilton Head tastes different and it's the same oyster. Absolutely. It, it, but it's not, the one at Hilton Head's not the same oyster, but it does taste different. And absolutely the, the um, habitat that the oyster is in definitely will, will define how the oyster tastes. How, how long has the birding festival been going on and is it helping bring awareness to the area? Um, yes, ma'am. It's been going on. This will be our 22nd birding festival this year. It's the biggest event of its kind in the world. It has, this is going to be the best one, too. And I have on Saturday afternoon, and we're working on a discounted rate to get locals in, I have five outstanding speakers on water, Florida's water quality coming in. And then our final keynote speaker will be Max Stone, who is... Um, He's like the primo Everglades photographer. And so the final final keynote will be a program on the Everglades, and you will you will leave with a major understanding of why we have to restore the flow of water south through the Everglades and quit dumping it into the, the estuaries on the eastern and the west side of Lake Okeechobee. It, it's gonna be phenomenal. So 22 years and counting. So that's bringing awareness Yes, ma'am, and that's why we started it. That's exactly why we started it. We, we started it to try to educate local people about the value of the natural resources that we have here so that they would demand that they be preserved. You know, because, you know, when we started the festival, we were in a huge period of growth. You know, in the 1990s, it was, it was crazy. And so we wanted to, to we want, you know, people need to slow down and understand that you need to preserve some natural areas too, you know, for your own health, for our own health. So we, that's why we started the festival was to create, we had no idea that we'd end up with exhibitors and birders literally from all over the world. That wasn't part of the plan, but it, it evolved. <coughs> and so if you like to travel, 40% of our exhibitors are from South America, Central America, South Africa, they run, they run these fabulous tours and operate these wonderful lodges and, uh, 
and, and the talks, there's over 50 talks um, that, that, that would be wonderful. So uh, come and see us. Yes, ma'am. I have one question that's personal about Dixie Crossroads. And why did you pick rock shrimp to be your specialty item? Because we started the rock shrimp industry. You did? Yes, ma'am. OK. I, you like eating rock shrimp and are split open oh, yeah. and roll like lobsters? Yeah. Well, that was another thing I did when I was 15 years old. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other civilized stuff. <laughs> In mom's kitchen. My mother ran a production line for, for rock shrimp using neighborhood kids for months while they were getting started. <laughs> That's a good business model. <laughs> 